Thanks for listening to The Breakdown and subscribing to The Australian. It is the support of subscribers like you that allows us to bring you this podcast. As well as the exclusive first access to episodes, your subscription means you can stay up to date with the latest developments at theaustralian.com.au slash the breakdown. Fast forward quite a way forward where you're in the last two to become the CEO of Rugby Australia. Can you talk to me about that experience? Uh, it was... Uh, it's hard to describe, really. This is Phil Kearns, the former Wallaby captain, a passionate supporter of the game that can often be found at his local rugby club, Mossman. He's a smart guy. He's a financial executive. He's on boards all over the place. He raised $30 million for children's hospitals. Right now, he's running Australia's 2027 Rugby World Cup bid. But in 2017, he applied for the role of Rugby Australia's CEO. It was a bizarre process. Uh, It was seven interviews uh, over nine weeks um, and with just about every person (laughs) that's ever been an official in Australian rugby, uh, representatives from pretty much every state, um, Rugby Australia board at different periods of time. Uh, The chairman was in those meetings, uh, probably four of them. It was a pretty painful process just because it was so drawn out and getting access to, well, this, the story I was told was getting access to certain directors was really difficult because they had busy lives and that sort of stuff. Um, and that's just what you're being told by the person that's running the process. Uh, and so it was it was a very convoluted, drawn out, Affair, and newspaper journalists journalists get access to information, and you know it come, becomes pretty obvious at the end of the day that it was down to down to two people. What did you think about what happened? How did you find out that it wasn't to be your? Oh, I got a phone call from Cameron Klein, um, who who told me uh, that I didn't have the job, uh, and that the board had decided to go down the path of having a sports administrator run the game and that I hadn't been a sports administrator so that sort of ruled me out and um, and Raylene got the job. Then Kearns got another phone call. It was Raylene Castle, the woman who had just been picked for his dream job. She wanted to have coffee. When Raylene asked you for a coffee, you didn't say no, did you? Even though you just finished runner, runner up to her. No, no, we had a coffee in the rocks um, not long after um, she'd been given the job. And, you know, it's for the good of the game. And, you know, you you got to be bigger than that and you've got to move on. So, and, and uh, you know, I've always got on well with Raylene. I didn't have a lot to do with her, but always whenever we'd be in a function or something together, you know, say good day and that sort of stuff. Um, and if anyone has ever asked me to do anything for the game, then I'll do it. Um, she didn't ask me to do anything necessarily for the game, and but nor did I expect it to, and it probably would have been a bit awkward for her to, to ask that as well. Um, but I would have. I guess, what did she want to pick your brains about? <laughs> um, she wanted to know what my ideas for the game were, um, which I thought was a, a pretty strange question. Um, to ask me um, because her ideas were clearly better than my ideas because she got the job. Board member Anne Cherry, one of Australia's most powerful corporate leaders, saw the coffee date differently. And the things she did to manage stakeholders would be all the things that you would normally do to manage your stakeholders. You'd get to keep your enemies close and, you know, your friends close as well and understand their perspective and try and let them see you as human as opposed to uh, some sort of archetype that was being painted. Uh, So, you know, maybe that says something about the rugby culture, that people saw this as so unusual, Uh, whereas I I saw it actually as quite normal. And also I thought it was a good thing for her to do, to let people get to know her so they couldn't demonise her 
without getting to know her better. Two years later, Raylene Castle resigned from the job amid massive controversy. But the truth is, the game was already in a bad shape when she stepped in. In Phil Kearns' view, rugby had been run for too long by people who didn't focus enough on the grassroots of the game, and the costs were piling up. Even before uh, before Raylene, um, there was a lack of connection between the board and the grassroots of the game. Um, a number of the board members didn't have a rugby background, they didn't play the game, they didn't have kids that played the game, they weren't a member of their local rugby club, they don't go down and watch their local um, local team play, um, didn't go to super rugby games. Um, so that lack of knowledge of your, I'll call it product, I hate the game being called a product, but the lack of knowledge of that and how that whole ecosystem fits together was a real uh, impediment to the advancement of the game um, because you're not, you then start to make decisions based not on what's good for the game. This is episode five. It explores one of the most hectic and controversial chapters in Australian sporting history. It looks at exactly what happened when a woman by the name of Raylene Castle starts running the game they play in heaven and how all hell broke loose after a star player, Israel Flau, got busy on social media. Castle was a Kiwi. She'd been running netball in New Zealand. Then she became Rugby League's first female chief executive at the Bulldogs. There was an unfortunate controversy over the salary cap when she was at the Bulldogs, but word is she interviewed brilliantly for the role at Rugby Australia. She was backed in by a board keen to diversify their leadership and the code. Women's rugby was on the rise. The Australian women had just won the sevens gold medal at the Rio Olympics. But the Australian's chief rugby writer, Wayne Smith, who has been covering the game since 1971, said Castle was on the back foot from the start. Uh, look, I, I, there was, I mean, A for starters, the person that she beat for the job was Phil Kearns. So instantly... Um, you know, you're getting you're, you're getting a two times World Cup winner, um, getting you know beaten by a woman that no one had ever heard of, uh, who'd come from New Zealand from a rugby league background, who had been at uh, the Bulldogs. You know, I mean, basically her her CV was about as bad as you could get it in many in many people's eyes. So, and of course there was that legacy of of what had happened at uh, the Bulldogs and contractual um, you know issues there. So that all spilled over uh, into her progress into rugby, um, which I've got to say um, was basically as turbulent as you could get it. Um, uh, you know, she wasn't in the in, in the job very long at all before Israel Folau, um, you know, first uh, showed the other side of his um, um, of his personality. Israel Folau a total freak of a sportsman. He played rugby league for the Melbourne Storm, the Brisbane Broncos, the Maroons and Australia. Oh, look at the big fellow! Look at him go up! Look at him go down! Look at the scoreboard! Falau has scored! He's made a try! There's a knock on. This will be advantage. Play on. Here's Falau looking to equal the record. He will equal the record. 20 tries for Israel Falau. Then he crossed coats not to Union, but as a marquee signing for the new AFL franchise, the Greater Western Sydney Giants. In June 2010, he signed a four-year deal worth $6 million. It was a move to convert the kids of Western Sydney to Australian rules. This for his first goal in AFL football from outside 50. Hits it long, hits it straight. Izzy's on the board. But Israel Flau didn't love playing Australian football. After two years at the Giants, he was unhappy. He would later admit to feeling depressed and turning to booze and women as he struggled. So he quit. Then, Australian rugby came knocking with a million-dollar offer in 2013 and he took it. Flau was brilliant in rugby union. He started with the Waratahs in 2013. The same year, he debuted for the Wallabies against the British and Irish Lions. Touch of the football in a test match. What a 
But Israel Folau was unstoppable. Before long, he was rugby's best player. He was the fourth highest try scorer in Wallabies history. He scored a try on average in every two games he played, which in rugby is incredible. And one of the people he grew close to in rugby was his Waratahs coach, Michael Checker. And it was under Checker he won a Super Rugby title in 2014. You know, Michael Checker had an amazing relationship with Israel Folau. Checker moved up to be Wallabies coach and Folau rose with him. But religion got in the way of a Rugby World Cup in 2019. Israel Folau is a Christian and it was in rugby his faith grew stronger and became publicly more intense. Not so long ago, he'd been on the front of a gay magazine with his shirt off. Now suddenly, he was condemning homosexuality on social media. In 2017, as Australians prepared to vote on legalising same-sex marriage, Rugby Australia had declared its support for the yes case. Folau took to Twitter. He wrote, I love and respect all people for who they are and their opinions, but personally I will not support gay marriage. So far, so moderate. But Izzy was just warming up. In April 2018, an Instagram follower of Israel Folau's posed the question, what's God's plan for homosexuals? Locking his caps, Folau replied, Hell, unless they repent of their sins and turn to God. A fire was lit. The public uproar was intense and Raylene Castle called Israel. He didn't answer her calls. Eventually they met. They discussed it all and after the meeting, Castle fronted the press. While he was verbally warned by Raylene Castle not to do it again, nothing was ever set in stone. Here's the chief rugby writer, Wayne Smith, again. Now, Raylene Castle is, has been criticised for, you know, taking the woke line, um, you know, pro- political correctness. I really don't know um, that she could have done much differently. And let's face it, um, the, the whole Israel Folau affair, it, it, it didn't blow up at the first attempt. It, it blew up at the second attempt at the second uh, failure. So he was on notice and he had been taken aside and counselled by both Raylene Castle, by um, Michael Checker. They'd sat him down they said, mate, you just can't do this. We have got contractual obligations with companies that expect a certain standard. You just can't say those things. And what's more, he agreed. He said, I will never, ever do anything that will take rugby, um, you know, put rugby in a bad light. So on that basis, you know, and gave Raylene Castle a hug and a handshake, um, and on that basis she re-signed him. In February 2019, Israel Folau signed a new contract with Rugby Australia worth over $4 million. That contract took him all the way through to 2022. But, and this is important to note, there was not a single line written, there was no legally binding document stopping Folau from saying anything that may have been considered harmful to Rugby Australia. So, what happened next? And within six months, he'd done exactly the same uh, as he'd done before. Yep, six months later, Folau went harder. He really upped the fire and brimstone. He wrote on Instagram that those that are living in sin will end up in hell unless you repent. He also posted an image about who was going to hell. Drunks, homosexuals, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists and idolaters. This post set off its own kind of hellfire. After this, there were relentless waves of news stories and commentary around freedom of speech and religious freedoms. The whole thing was absolute hell for Rugby Australia. And what was happening in the inner sanctum of the Wallabies as all this chaos broke loose? And Wallabies coach Michael Checker said the situation was one of the most challenging of his career. Can you talk then to the Israel Flower situation and how that was handled by the administration and yourself as well? Um, I think uh, it's a really... It, it's, um, before you even talk about it, you've got to acknowledge that it's a very, very tip, uh, difficult subject, you know, because it's bordering on those things that are most personal to someone... Right, and then 
there's no defined role as to how your personal views play out and, you know, with sporting teams and all of that type of stuff. Michael Checker opens up for the first time about the impact it had on the inner sanctum. It affected the team number one because the team lost one of its best players. So there, there's <laughs> there's a uh, number one there. And then there's there's the other fallout that happens whenever you make an adversarial stance like that. Some people are always going to take one side and some people are always going to take another. So as the coach, I was trying to support the 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 game, like so Rugby Australia, obviously, I'm one of their people at that time, try to support them and support their stance, but maybe through uh, asking about it, having a less adversarial approach so we could maybe resolve the issue in another way. What was it like then? I'd love to hear about, you know, the impact on the team members and the team and how, how, how did you deal with that internally? Um, look, I don't... They're, they're, I suppose, pretty private matters, I think, and I, I understand that. Uh, I, I, for me, always, the locker room is very private and what happens with the team. Um, but it took a lot of us... Uh, like when we got together again, I think after this, that, that second incident and when, when it got very adversarial, the first chance we got to get together, I had to do a lot of talking. There was with players sort of one-on-one beforehand, before we got together, I think it was in May of 2019 in Brisbane in the World Cup, where we, we had a camp, we got together and we broke it up into small... We had to acknowledge it and discuss it. Right, so we could get everything off anyone's chest and at least start a process there towards getting the team connected because that type of connectivity is super important. Like I said, too, if you're going into a tussle where you're not going in as favourites, like we're going into a World Cup, we're not going going in as favourites at all. You know, we're way back in as far as our favouritism per se. So we needed to be totally aligned, and I had to try and make adjustments. Because there was a misalignment, not, I don't think through anyone's fault either. I'm certainly not looking to point the finger at anyone for that. But so when you take certain actions, they're going to have a reaction at the other side, and that splintered a few areas that I wanted to try to get back together. Which I think we did pretty successfully. Like we kept it together as best we could um, in that regard, and you know. And I think what happens there is it just. Because the other thing too is there was a continual noise from the outside. You know, it's very hard to quarantine yourself from that as players. Um, you know, whether it be through social media or through the standard media, etc. So it's that once you start that process, the echo through the different um, groups that will take up the fight, right and. Trust me in saying that, um, you know, I felt that. Um, I felt the negative end of that, you know, face-to-face and um, on several occasions. And and I knew that would be the case because you're the, if you're the a, a sort of one of the faces of where the stand has been coming from, that that's going to happen. And that, that does takes its toll. Raylene Castle received death threats from people with passionate views about the Flower situation. There are some observers like Phil Kearns, who are privy to the inner sanctum, who suspect the problem could have been resolved if Checker had been allowed to quietly find a way for everyone to back down with their dignity intact. And Check was sort of taken out of the loop um, in handling of that situation. And I can't help but think that if Check had been uh, allowed to handle the situation, it may not have got where it did. Former Prime Minister John Howard was close to a number of Wallabies players and coaches, including Michael Checker. Howard would often call up Checker to give him a bit of support. When I start asking the former Prime Minister about his good relationship with Checker, Israel Folau's name pops up. It's the first time the ex-PM has offered a view. I like Michael a lot, and it was, it was difficult. And, and I know it was, a, it was a sensitive issue, but... It, it was a great shame that, that we lost Israel Folau, I think. And, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the rights and wrongs. All I can say is that, is that it was a great shame that arguably the, you know, some people regard it as, as, as the best player of the code uh, in the, uh, anywhere at that particular time that we lost him. It was a terrible. You know, one way or another, it's a great pity that it happened. But it happened. 
Others will tell you the handling of the Falau situation was the true start of Castle's undoing. Now you have to know, Checker and Castle had a difficult relationship at times. They even had an unglamorous shouting match in the Australian Embassy in Japan at the World Cup in 2019. But Checker says the Falau situation was unprecedented. It's quite clear that myself and Raylene didn't always see eye to eye on things, but it's hard to be critical of of her in that situation because no one's written the... There's no uh, sort of uh, playbook or rules around that. hadn't been set for her, so it's hard to judge, right? Uh, My... I think no matter what happened internally, because it was such a grey area, I always believed a less adversarial approach was the right way to get things done. Because when once you go adversarial, it's nearly impossible to find a resolution so that you can maybe get on with something. And a resolution that could mean um, it could work in your favour or might work in the other person's favour or might have a bit of both that let you get on without doing too much damage around uh, the sport in this instance or around your brand if it's in business or whatever it might be. It's it's crisis management, you know, and I think that uh, once we took the very adversarial approach, it was always destined. We're always destined to have a have a, have a lot of damage and a lot of fallout. So Checker believes the problem was not what rugby did, but the way it was done. Too public, too adversarial. Remember, Checker was one of the closest people in the game to Flau, but it all got out of hand. What happened next was absolutely chaotic. Just months out from the biggest tournament on the calendar, the Rugby World Cup in Japan, Israel Folau was sacked. The lead-up to his sacking went like this. He met with Rugby Australia boss Raylene Castle on April 12, two days after the second post, and he was told in the strongest terms that his language was unacceptable. And it was then Folau strongly considered pulling down the post. He went as far as telling his father that he was considering taking it down to save his rugby career. His father's response to that idea? You'll go to hell, son. Folau didn't take it down, even though he says Rugby Australia offered him money to do so. Here he is speaking to Alan Jones and Peter Credlin on Sky News in June 2019. Look, if I, if I had a child that was an, a, a drug addict, um, yeah, I, I would certainly still love my child... Um, you know, without with, without any anything attached to that, you know, it, it's it's uh, something that um, you know I, I'm trying to share in love, and 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 that's the way I look at it. With uh, in terms of sharing the Bible and, and the passages with um, you know my fellow men each day. Did you ever agree with Rugby Australia to not send the tweet in question? No, no, I didn't. Um, did they ask you to remove it? Yes. Did they offer you money? If you removed it? Yes. And you said? I said no, you know, I, I couldn't do that uh, as, a, as a person that's convicted by my faith. Um, I, I, couldn't live, I couldn't live with that. I would play as... Well, so, sorry, Peter, Peter. Yeah, please. Uh, asking you to remove it and paying you to remove it, is that because they wanted the problem to go away and they wanted to then say, what, there was an admission and that you did the wrong thing? Was that how they'd sell it? Yes, I, th- that's how they looked at it. And... You know, I felt like I was backed into a corner, um, in, into a boundary where, um, you know, I, I was put into one side that I, you know, had to compromise in order to, you know, to agree to, to what they were asking. But, um, you know, in the end, uh, like I said, I, I couldn't do it because, uh, you know, my faith to me is, is what's most important. For Lau then took legal action against Rugby Australia, demanding $14 million in compensation and an apology for what he claimed was unlawful dismissal. In the end, they settled out of court for a figure believed to be around $4 million. Getting rid of Israel Folau was a board decision. After hot debate, they had made the call. Rugby's biggest sponsor was Qantas, which was a proud corporate champion of gay rights. But three sources have told us clearly that Qantas did not tell rugby to sack Folau. Qantas said, make this problem go away. Here's Anne Cherry. So the Falau issue came up twice, if you recall. And the first time, uh, rugby was very conciliatory with him. Uh, So there was always the tension of uh, someone who was, um, you know, a magic player. 
uh, who brought life to the game and had incredible skill against someone who was using his position as a star marquee player to proselytise views that were deeply offensive, not just to the many in the rugby community, certainly not all, but many, uh, were deeply offensive also to many of our sponsors who made it possible to pay him the big bucks uh, and were, from a social point of view, painting rugby into a corner that we didn't want to be in. And those things in any environment um, are the hardest decisions you ever have to make. You see it in corporates as well, where you've got a you know really great performing CEO or executive who does terrible things and suddenly everyone's looking for excuses for why it's not as bad as it is. If Israel Folau didn't play rugby, nobody would care what he thought. And he could say it till the cows come home, but he used the platform that came with being a rugby player, particularly a social media platform, that came with his rugby status to proselytise those views. And that's where the difference sits. Former Wallaby Dan Palmer last year penned a powerful piece in the Sydney Morning Herald, openly speaking about his sexuality for the first time. He is the first Wallaby to come out as gay. Palmer wrote about how hiding his sexuality put him in a downward spiral and why he hoped coming out would help others confronting the same struggle. This is Palmer speaking on the project. What motivated you to go from somebody who really protects their privacy to writing so beautifully about what had previously been something you kept very much to yourself? Mm. Well, lots happened between those times and the Israel Folau commotion um, has happened and uh, young people, they look up to people like Israel and, and when your idol is saying things that whether he knows it or not are a direct attack on you. Well, he's telling then, people they're going to go to hell. Yeah, yeah <laughs> he is. That's what he's doing. Uh, I think that that can have a dramatic effect. I, I don't think that he was um, being malicious in the sense that he was trying to hurt people but the consequences are are just as bad. You can absolutely not necessarily have bad intentions, but you have bad ideas. Did this whole thing need to be an ugly public brawl? Here's Ellen Jones. Talk to me about the Israel Flower saga and what's your assessment of it now, 12 months on? Look what damage it did. What? To play woke? To play woke? I mean, the answer to Israel was to say... Well, I must probably don't agree with any of this, but, I mean, he, he has his say, but we're picking football players here. Um, I mean, no one out there thinks that someone who's gay is going to go to hell. And, but if someone says, say, if we penalised everyone for everything that people said that we didn't agree with, well, we'd have no starters at all. And the business about Israel Folau is immensely personal. It's nothing to do with rugby. Immensely Did it, Would Israel Folau offend it? Never would intend to offend anybody, Israel Folau. He's as gentle as all hell. And look what happened. Castle, cost them a million, everything, lost a play alienated the public and so we went on so you know he's amongst our best players why isn't he being picked in the Australian team that's leadership leadership requires people sometimes to take unpopular positions but to explain and justify those positions will everyone agree no but they'll respect you if you explain it and justify it we're doing things for Australian rugby are we foregoing principles no we're not I'm not saying that everyone agrees with Israel any more than they agree with me, but we're here to pick the best Australian team and we're not going to pander to our opponents who are hoping like hell that we banish our best player. And we did. It was clear that money wasn't his god. He had a god. And did this mean surrendering his contract? Yes, it did. Um, But he was going to defend that um, in the courts and they carried on with this hairy-chested stuff. We're going to go out there. Well, at the end of the day, they knew they couldn't win. And they had to settle, which was a humiliation for Australian rugby. Wayne Smith saw the entire Israel issue differently. I personally always looked on it as a an employer-employee relationship dispute. I know it's been, been cast as a, a freedom of speech, a freedom of religion Um uh, issue and and yes, there are the, there are those sides of it. And let's face it, as a journalist, 
I'm hardly going to be taking, um, you know, opposing free speech. But I just believe that um, he overstepped the mark on that occasion. And I don't know whether uh, sacking him was was the right option, but he'd, he'd done it twice. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how many times more he could have pushed the envelope. So, uh, so Railing Castle, Railing Castle copped all of this. Um, my only complaint, I, I have said several times in print, or I had said several times in print, judge her as you would judge any CEO. If she's failing um, as a CEO, then by all means get rid of her. I just objected to the fact that that a lot of the criticism was because she wore a skirt. Um, she was a woman, uh, basically in a man's job, uh, having beaten one of the greats of, uh, of Australian rugby uh, to that job. Um, so the, the odds were stacked against her. Nick Farr-Jones, the former Wallabies captain, is a well-known Christian. Farr-Jones met with the Flowers during it all and says at one point he considered advising Flower to apologise, but in the end he left the young man to make his own call. Oh, look, I think it, it sits as a, a significant precedent for sport, um, you know, about what you should include in contracts, um, the way you you give discretion to players to use their judgment. Look, I, I've always said that there are much better ways, as a Christian, there are much better ways for Israel to express his faith and, and warn people against the consequences of sin. You know, you talk about the love of God and the love of Christ and the sacrifice. Um, you don't bang people over the heads with the consequences of sin, at least in my view. Um, so there were many, m- much better ways that Israel could have expressed his love, but he did want to warn people of the consequences of sin. I know he's got a fire and brimstone father um, who probably, you know, sort of, you know, encouraged him and to, to, to not have great judgment in that, you know, sort of that, um, that post that he put out. But again, the way it was mismanaged and the way that, a corporate sponsor was able to pressure a chief executive into quickly a quick knee-jerk decision, which was the wrong decision, and effectively cost multiple millions of dollars to the game, and and put it on the front page of not just Australian newspapers, but you know, sort of global newspapers. Um, there were just much better ways to handle that. But it, look, it, it goes down as a precedent. There's no doubt about that. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really go to court. It was settled out of court, so you don't really have that judicial precedent that other sports can look at as to what a Supreme Court or maybe even a High Court um, found as to, you know, industrial relations and labour laws. After all this, life did not get any better for Rayland Castle. The critics did not let up. Castle asked to meet with Alan Jones. He said sure. So she arrived at his apartment in the toaster, which overlooks the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. She sat down on his couch and they had a candid conversation. What do you think Raylene Castle's legacy is? Raylene Castle's? Uh, there's none. Uh, just totally unsuited for the job. And ask Canterbury, don't ask me. Ask Canterbury. Uh, look, I don't care. It's got nothing to do with gender. I'm just, you know, the answer is look at the scoreboard. Now, I had one meeting with Raylene Castle and I politely said to her that, um, that I thought... The job was beyond her, and and I thought it would be sensible for her to recognise all of this, and to just say it's not what I thought it would be. It's too difficult for me, and in the interest of the game, I'll go. Claire Rayland Castle didn't want to be interviewed for this podcast, but you've had some long conversations with her, haven't you, about this very issue? Yeah, I think this is a really important issue for sport around the world. This is athletes expressing opinions, right? In another context, this is American football is taking a knee. It's cricketers wanting to do a barefoot circle. It's individuals who suddenly have a platform on social media to express all sorts of opinions which might not be popular with sporting officials and with sponsors. So, you know, what are the sports going to do? It, it, it's something that's got to be grappled with. Uh, I, I think a lot of corporates have watched this happen in sport as well and have thought, please, God, don't let any of our employees do something like this on social media because how would we handle it? Claire, as we go to record this podcast, the St George Dragons have tabled an offer to Israel Folau, but they've also withdrawn it, and that was after it hit the press. 
that they were offering him a contract. This issue is far too hot to handle for all sporting codes and I think it raises the question around, you know, what kind of moral compass do all these footy codes have if they allow, say, players with criminal records back to play but not Israel Folau? Like, why should he be denied a contract? Yeah, I've spoken to a bunch of people about this and one of, one of the interesting things that Anne Sherry said, who's the, the long-time board member of Rugby Australia who supported the decision to uh, sack Israel, was the difference with a lot of those other issues is, for example, football is taking a knee, is that what Israel said was directly in conflict with one of Rugby Australia's espoused v- you know, values, which is inclusion. So they're trying to recruit families, kids, who may be gay or may not be, or, you know, maybe they're drunks and fornicators. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he, he's out there on his platform uh, being totally contrary to what rugby is supposed to stand for. So it's just such a dilemma. And I think it's blighted Raylene Castle's legacy as well. You know, I think it's now the thing that she's publicly associated with. I think she's certainly uh, proud of things that she achieved during her time in rugby. She's very proud of the fact that she set up a um, national framework for high performance in the sport and some other things that, that she got done, big things. But, you know, rugby's a poison chalice, isn't it? It seems like everyone has come into this role and had some nightmarish disaster unfold in front of them. And for Raylene Castle, it was Israel Folau. There's a moment where the fortunes of the code would be remarkably different today. For 25 years, rugby has been on Foxtel in Australia. At the end of 2020, a $285 million five-year deal with Foxtel and 10 was about to expire. In November 2019, Foxtel offered $125 million US dollars for another five years, but Castle walked away. She was confident she could get $100 million more. But then COVID hit and rugby season was paused, along with most sport, and negotiations stalled. In April 2020, a group of former Wallabies captains who'd spent years privately sharing their concerns about the game's woeful finances, shrinking relevance, and now the possibility of no broadcast deal, decided to take a public stand. The 12 captains, including Nick Farr Jones and George Gregan, wrote a letter to the board, which was handed to the then chairman, Paul McLean. The Australian broke the story of the letter and it went off like a bomb. In recent times, the Australian game has lost its way, says the letter obtained by the Australian. It is a defeat inflicted not by COVID-19 or an on-field foe, but by poor administration and leadership over a number of years. Our rural clubs, junior clubs, sub-districts and community clubs have been let down, and we firmly believe that transformation is needed across the game in this country. There is no time to waste. We speak as one voice when we say that Australian rugby needs new vision, leadership and a plan for the future. The plan must involve, as a priority, urgent steps to create a much-needed, sustainable commercial rugby business. Nick Farr Jones, who we now know, walked away from the game at the end of 2015. He said the 2019 World Cup in Japan ignited his interest in the game again, but he decided to sign the letter for a number of reasons. And I knew that I'd had to walk from the game to an extent to get the passion back, um, which I now have for the game, and to go to the World Cup in 2019 in Japan, which I really love. So I walked away from the game. And it wasn't till, to answer your question about the captain's letter, it wasn't really until early last year when a few of the guys, the captains, would call me and, and start to talk to me about what was going on in Rugby Australia and the wastage and the 200 employees and what roles people had and you know obviously I witnessed the Falau you know sort of mismanagement as I would call it um, and then I started to talk to some people that I knew extremely well um, one particular company that's been a great supporter of of rugby in this country for three decades and I started to hear the truths of what was happening to those supporters those sponsors. Um, the neglect and, to be honest, just the, the lack of recognition that Rugby Australia was showing to some of those really important sponsors who'd been around the game for, as I said, three decades. I agreed to join up with the other captains and, and you know, we drafted that letter and um, I just thought it was really, really necessary. 
Anne Cherry, who was off the board by this stage, has this to say about the captain's letter. It made me feel as though the old guard were trying to reassert themselves. Because rugby has more captains than just wallaby captains. Uh, again, we say we're an inclusive sport. Sevens had been on the scene for a decade. Amazing captains, men and women. It was a group of the... Um, it was a, And it wasn't all the captains either. Mm. It was a, a particular group who had been gingering behind the scenes for some time, who felt that Phil Kearns should have been CEO, so they were in that camp. And they're a tight group. Mm. But there had already been rumblings at board level that Castle's time was done. The Wallabies' captain's letter amplified it all. It was, a, it, it was basically, you know, using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, um, in my opinion, uh, but it did the job. Just days later, Castle resigned. She gave a statement to just one media outlet, the ABC. In the last couple of hours, it has been made clear to me that the board believes my no longer being the CEO would help give them the clear air they believe they need. The game is bigger than any one individual, so this evening I told the chair, Paul McLean, that I would resign from the role. Wayne Smith feels Castle was treated unfairly. People will look back on her term and... Yes, there will be uh, there will be a degree of uh, well, there'll be quite a degree of criticism because not much that she attempted worked out. But uh, I always felt she was playing with a stack deck, um, and and it it she didn't really um, have the opportunity to to show her wares. I didn't feel um, she was basically under criticism, and of course, the criticism generated um, you know a siege mentality. So the more she was criticised, the more she retreated into herself. Um, and, you know, in the end, uh, I, I thought the board members, and, and let's face it, you, you will find that there were a number of board members that um, wanted to fight on her behalf, um, but it just reached the point where they couldn't get any clear air. If, if her name was involved, then it, it, it wouldn't... Um, it wouldn't have flown. So um, for the good of the game, basically, she fell on the sword. Producer of this podcast, Claire Harvey, spoke with long-time Australian rugby board member Anne Cherry. Was she up against uh, sexism? Sexism? Mm. Did you say? Yes, uh, oh, sorry. Sexism. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yes, she was. Uh, I mean, th- there was a lot of debate about uh, the reaction to appointing a woman to that job. At board level. Because, yeah, because of the, um, the nature of the stakeholders that, uh, that the board was managing. And, um, and even the stakeholders in media, you know, many of whom are um, former players and, and who have a very strong view about the sort of people they'd like to see in the job. Everyone had a view. Mm. Uh, much more than in corporate roles. This was a, this was mm. a job where everyone had a view. Mm. And uh, so we were, we were conscious of trying to set her up to be as successful as she could be by, uh, you know, helping her with the stakeholder management. And to be fair to her, she did a huge amount of work when she first came into that role to reach out to um, former Wallabies coaches, uh, former players. I mean, she did the rounds to sit, to sit down in front of the people she knew uh, could make or break her. Um, and that included Alan Jones. <laughs> Alan Jones, who was, of course, one of the people who then was relentless in uh, critiquing her almost every, every day in that job. I asked Wayne Smith what he thinks Australian rugby's greatest flaw has been. Just a note on Wayne, he's an exceptional journalist with five decades of experience, but he also loves this game. I believe that Australia, um, you know, once it was once it was the most professional in the amateur era, I think it became the most amateurish in the, in the professional era. Um, so it it didn't it didn't have a a really tight focus on what it needed to do. I actually believe that. Um, because Australia had such a 
a significant rugby league presence um, in the in the amateur era. Um, that made Australian rugby in the amateur era the most professional body in world rugby. Um, it was without question the most switched on uh, because it had to be because it was fighting rugby league because rugby league was making inroads left and right. So rugby had to do whatever it could to to fight them off, and in doing so, you know, it gave them you know the opportunity to to fight off the All Blacks and the Springboks and what have you. So I also ask Wayne, whose fault is it that the game has reached such a low? You know, the, the, the trouble is that, you know, we, we're all the time, you know, looking to find fault. And, you know, these were, you know, and they were basically men back apart from Raylene. I mean, obviously, in, in recent times, we've had uh, more and more women coming onto the board. But um, for a long time, they were men and they were they were honourable men trying to do the best job that that they could uh, as they saw it. Um, and. I've, I've got to say, it's been it's been a hell of a turbulent decade, irrespective of who was in charge of Australian rugby. Uh, I mean, you know, John O'Neill and I came to blows um, back in about 2011, um, and you know, it was clear <laughs> uh, one of us wasn't going to survive. Uh, now, as it was, he took it on himself uh, to resign in 2013, but. Um, and, and pri- primarily, I think, to move on to to other uh, other interests. But um, it it was it was it was an era that that um, it was almost you know what what's the worst thing that can happen right now? Oh God, it's just happened, you know. So the Israel Folau thing, uh, and then you know having to shoot itself uh, rugby shoot itself in the foot by culling one of the Super Rugby teams. I mean. Here we are today. The game is $20 million in the red. They have a loan from World Rugby propping them up. They are hinging a lot of hope on securing a World Cup in 2027. Rugby clubs are dying. Kids don't know who the Wallabies are. It's about um, maybe reimagining what it can look like so that it thrives. In, in, in difficult time, that it can not just survive, but it can then go on and thrive and flourish um, in the future. In the next and final episode of The Breakdown, we explore how rugby nearly became amateur again. Yep, that's right, amateur. Sounds pretty drastic, but is that the future? We talk to Rugby Australia chairman Hamish McLennan and a Wallabies captain who really understands what's going on in the bush. And we ask the question, Who is going to save this game? This has been The Breakdown, brought to you by The Australian. I'm Jessica Halloran, and this podcast was produced by Claire Harvey, with special thanks to Dylan Adams, Grace Richardson, Eric George, Stephen Samuelson, Wally Mason, and Nick Adams Jasper. Please subscribe to help us make quality journalism. Check us out at theaustralian.com.au.